Uh, we are in our series on the Gospel of John. We're just marching through, both at a really surfacey, all over the gospel level, and hopefully also a deeper level. As we've said every week, the Gospel of John is a gospel that has been described as a pool deep enough for elephants to swim, but shallow enough for children to wade. We're trying to really engage in that by showing both the accessibility of the gospel. Most of these texts, like, make sense on a surface level, but also the depth of what is happening here. The, the author, John, names these artfully seven titles of Jesus given in the first chapter. The author gives us seven different miracles that Jesus gives. He calls them signs because it is something that is a sign pointing to Jesus, not just some one-off miracle. He gives us seven different I am statements that reveal who God is, who's God becoming, all that goes with that. So I kind of want to let us see the book through both its depth and its shallowness, but also to take it at what the book says it's doing. In John chapter 20, we are told, but these things are written so that you believe in Jesus is the Christ, God's son, and that believing you will have life in his name. So really the lens that we are bringing to this passage, this whole book, is these stories of what the gospel might be doing to make us live lives that are better, that are more abundant, that are more flourishing, that are all that goes with that. Uh, So we're going to dig in. Last week we started kind of with these seven signs that John offers throughout the book. I think there's a list of them. And this week we're going to dig in and zero in on the healing of the blind man. John, not one to be outdone in word count. Uh, This story is the entire chapter of nine. So lean on in. I'm going to try to chapter nine. I'll try to break it up a little bit as we go. So we are in John nine, chapter one. As verse one, goodness gracious. Sorry, everybody. As he, Jesus, walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Quick note. Common belief in Jesus' day. Also a common belief today that if there is something wrong with your body, if there is a disability, there is an illness, there is a something, you or someone else probably did something to make that happen. Uh, So there's an assumption in the Pharisaical times, in the times of Jesus, that if you are born blind, someone has caused that blindness not just chance. But if we're honest, I don't know how many of you have gotten sick or gotten or known someone that's gotten cancer and been asked like, well, have you been eating your vegetables or did you get that shot or whatever? We still look for reasons to blame. Uh, And so this is actually more familiar than I think we would like to be. But he goes on. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and was able and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he, and others were saying, No, but it is someone that looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept saying, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered them, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And then I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. I think this might feel like a moment where they're, being, they're tattling on Jesus. Here's the guy that can see, do something about it. What's a more reasonable reading is a guy in their community had a miracle done to him, and they want to show their rabbis. They want to show the people that they have been led spiritually by. So this is not anyone trying to doom anybody at this point. Now, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened, and he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of the man who had received his sight. And they said to them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered. It gets really repetitive in here, but I think that's purposeful. We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. 
Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Quick point, if the parents are nervous about acknowledging who they think Jesus is, and the reason they're nervous is because if you believe Jesus is the Messiah, you'll be kicked out, the parents are already starting from the assumption that Jesus is the Messiah and are nervous about making their rabbis angry. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, is I was blind, and now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you this already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? If you like him so much, why don't you marry him, you know? (laughs) Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone's eye opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. It's almost like that scene from Captain Phillips of like, I am the rabbi now. You know, he's really flipped the roles here. I thought that joke would go better. And he answered, you were born entirely of sins. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came to this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and for those who see, do see will become. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely are, we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. There's a lot going on in this story. It's like all of the verses in the Bible, for one. But also just a lot going on. So firstly, you have Jesus' disciples who see a blind guy and want to know what sin caused his blindness. Then you have Jesus who kind of jujitsus that whole answer and says they have work to do and heals the guy anyway. Then you have people who have paid so little attention to this dude that they can't make up their minds on whether or not this is the guy they've passed every single day in and out of the temple for years and years and years, despite the guy saying, it's me, can't you recognize me? Then the religious leaders who are way more concerned about when a healing took place rather than that it happened or when it happened or who it happened to, And the parents who know their son but are worried about the cost of standing up to their rabbis because they could end up outside of the community in the very same way their son did. And then the man himself who sat in the dark his whole life and some guy rubs mud made of spit in his eyes, which is unideal, and is healed. He finds himself somehow in trouble for being healed, unwitting and outsmarting religious experts of his day to the point where they exasperatedly ditch the conversation altogether. This chapter confronts the rigid theology that all sin or all sickness and illness is caused by sin, but it does a lot more than that. It upends who we understand sees who God is. It suddenly shifts from, oh, you should trust your religious experts to maybe the suffering have a lens to offer all of us. As a pastor, I feel very offended by that, but I'm moving on. But more than anything, What I think this story boils down to, and you heard the words repeated again and again and again, is this is a story about sight, about who sees who and how people see. The disciples don't see a blind man at the beginning of the story. They see an opportunity for theological reflection. He is a jumping off point for them wanting to understand how sin causes things. The Pharisees don't see a blind man. They see a rule that's been broken. The people that spent so many years walking by this guy have paid so little attention to him that now that he's finally worth looking at, they still struggle to know what they're looking at. And the parents see their child, obviously, but they're not really willing to put their necks out in a way that could result in the same treatment of them that has been given to their son for years and years and years. And then there's Jesus, who skips all of it looks at the guy, and sees the guy. 
He heals the guy without knowing anything else about him, not caring if this guy did anything to deserve it, not making sure the guy knew who he was before he did the healing, not making sure the guy has been forgiven of all his stuff or acknowledged that he has need or anything else. He walks up to a blind guy, rubs mud in his eyes, and tells him to go, and he is healed because he has a need. Now, people have struggled a lot with the response of Jesus to the disciples at the beginning. I would argue primarily just bad theologians that don't read the whole Bible. But they, this text is, neither this man nor his parents have sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And people have taken that to say, see, God blinded this baby so a decades later he could show off. That's kind of a weird thing for God to do, right? Like, that's a, that's a wild plan to make yourself look good. And that is a really bad reading of this text. All, hopefully, intuitively, in our guts, we know that feels wrong. That doesn't feel like who Jesus is. But if you just literally read the next verses in the passage, it starts to upend that whole framework. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Very tricky tongue twister. Also weird in Greek. Uh, Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the white light of the world. Here's how I would summarize that whole sentence. This man's disability is not about sin. I can use it to show you something about who God is. Because while I'm in the world, I'm going to bring sight to everyone I can. Light is coming. Full stop. Now, you might think, I wonder how Matt got there, but Eugene Peterson translates it this way. He's a hero of mine, so how dare you resist him. Uh, Jesus said, you are asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead at what God can do. We need to be energetically, we need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here while working while the sun shines. When night falls, the workday is over. For as long as I am in the world, there is plenty of light. I am the world's light. Jesus, who sinned so this guy would be blind? That is a ridiculous question. We can do things with it anyway. God does not want anyone to be born blind. Let's enter into that. We are only here for a limited time. It's all in the plural, by the way. This is one of the only signs where like, the entire act is it's our job collectively, which might invite us to lean in a little bit. There are only two people in this story that see humans. There is Jesus, who sees a blind man who needs to be healed, and there is a blind, formerly blind man who now sees, who sees the Messiah face to face. Nobody else in this story sees two humans. Everyone else is distracted by asking the right questions, doing the right things, avoiding the wrong consequences. And I think if we're honest, many of us at different times in our lives fall into those latter categories. I could help that person, but it might cost me a lot. I could help that person, but what if I helped them in the wrong way and there was a better way I could have helped them? Like, we let perfect be the enemy of good all the time. We want to help, but we don't know where the people are because we don't see them, literally or figuratively. We want to help, but we're worried about doing it perfectly, so why start it all until we've done all the research? We want to help, but it could cost us too much. What would people say? What would people think? What would it look like to me if I was seen with those people? We want to help, but the rules say we shouldn't. I'm not supposed to, to give someone a ride this place or that place because it's unsafe or whatever else it might be. And we look at Jesus and he just bypasses all of it. I am here to bring light to the world. I see a person who needs light. Let's heal that person. Rules be damned. Consequences be damned. Day of the week be damned. When healing needs to be done, Jesus heals because he sees people. Jesus recognizes when rules get in the way of healing. There's a reason why our little blue sign says, if your beliefs don't create love, drop them. Because the rabbis of Jesus' day had been so caught up in the rules that they did not care that the consequence was not being experienced as love by people. And instead, they wanted to follow the rules the rightest way. And that feels like a lot of people I know, including younger versions of myself, to be fully honest and transparent. But there is something different about the person of Jesus. There's something different about his understanding of what it means to look at people and see people and move towards people and heal people. After World War II and after the Holocaust, a lot of Jewish and Christian philosophers and theologians started writing a lot about how does this happen? 
How can the seat of all Christian theology for 500 years become the source of genocide? How can people let this happen to other human beings? How can we design systems that do that? Two of my favorite answers comes from the philosophers Emmanuel Levinas, who is French, and Martin Buber, who is, I think, uh, German and something else. Shouldn't have started naming where they're from. Both Jewish philosophers and theologians. And they both came up with more or less the same answer, though more succinctly from one than the other. Levinas says, you can do violence to people when you make them invisible. This is a story about sight, about everyone else not seeing this guy and Jesus seeing him. And when you see someone, you cannot do violence to them. We make people invisible, says Levinas, and when we do that, it gives us the power to do violence to them. Martin Buber says it a little bit differently. We make people its, and as soon as they become its and not people, then we can do violence to them. We see this everywhere today. They are not a human, they're a Democrat. They are not a Christian, they're a, or a person of Christ, they're a Republican. They are not a good human being, they drink Pepsi. Whatever your framework is, we do this all the time. That's not a person, that's a woman. That's not a person, that's a man. Like We put categories and labels on people, and as soon as we do it, we give ourselves permission to do violence to those beings. The call of the gospel of Jesus and the call of John 9 is look people in the eye, see them, and name them. And when you do that, do something about it. This is a hard message for any of us. It's a costly message for every one of us. But the reality is we're called to do things, to bring light into the world. There's work that we are set out to do, says Jesus here. But beyond that, I think for many of us, we go, I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to do this. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm burnt out as it is. This is not a message saying, go throw away all your boundaries and destroy yourself in the process. But it is a message to say, what if we start by seeing people? What if we start by labeling people with their core identity? That is a woman who is made in the image of God. Or a human who is made in the image of God who happens to be female. That is a person who is made in the image of God who happens to vote for Republican candidates. That is a human made in the image of God who happens to be a Democrat. That is a human made in the image of God who happens to like Ford trucks. Like whatever framework we put on people... What if we start with that is a human made in the image of God and then your descriptive characteristics? Because it's so much harder to hate a human made in the image of God than a jerk in a big truck who just cut you off, right? But as soon as that jerk in a big truck is actually first and foremost an image bearer of the divine creator of the universe— Boy, I better be more careful about how I say words about that thing, that person, that being, right? The call of the Gospel of John, the call of John 9, is see people first. Jesus loves to debrief what happened with his disciples. There would have been plenty of time, actually, to stop and say, let's talk about where sin comes from and how it results in disability or how it doesn't result in disability. There's plenty of time after the fact, sitting around the fire that night, to name a little bit about who God is and how sin impacts the world. But he knows that any minute longer of this guy sitting in darkness is longer than it needs to be. So enter in and bring the light and then deal with the stuff afterwards. There's an invitation to us in it. I want to be a person who sees people. I know we are a church filled with people who see people. And I know we can learn from one another in that process. So I just want to invite you today to do the work to figure out how to see. And then I trust each and every one of you that once you see who is in front of you, you and God together can decide how to love and care for that person. That's actually the work that y'all do in and of yourselves, that we do in our own spaces, in our own hearts, in our own minds. It'd be great to say, like, and now we're rolling out an initiative where we're going to go support Howard Street in New Way. That'd be cool, but I actually don't think that's honoring to who we are as a community. I'd much rather say, do the work to see people. And then if the fact that you see a bunch of middle school kids over there every day after school sitting outside and you go, man, maybe we should do something about them because of what's stirring in you, 
great. But then we're led by what's happening in our hearts and not some goal that we've all set for ourselves, some initiative that we're rolling out. May we be a people that see. May we be a people that look past the labels and the questions and the wondering the best way to do it and look people in the eyes. One of the things I learned in sitting with unsheltered people is how often people avoid eye contact with them and how dehumanizing that can be after day after day after day of people not looking you in the eyes. That's equally true, by the way, problematically so, if you are the checker at a fast food restaurant or you are the server. We don't look people in the eyes. Church, let's become people that are really good at eye contact. Let's become people that see people, whether they look like us or think like us or vote like us or act like us or dress like us or anything else. I think the promise of the Gospel of John in chapter 9 is that when we do the work to see, light happens. Let's pray. Jesus, may you give us your words. May you bring the light. May you help us know who you've invited us to be. May you help us see who you've put in front of us. You're good. You're holy in my name. Amen.